Greetings fellow travelers through the liturgical year. This is Lisa Davis with a rare Holy Week Feast Day Quick Take. Today's feast day square on the calendar falls into a patch of light this year that's usually in the shadow of the great feast of the Annunciation. It's hard to separate today's date, March 25th, from this great feast, at least in my mind. But because Easter is so early this year, the church translates or moves the Feast of the Annunciation so that it isn't in competition with the Lenten observations that take precedence. Today being Monday in Holy Week, the gravity of the apex of the penitential season comes first, followed by Easter and the celebration of Easter Week, which means that the Feast of the Annunciation will be celebrated on the first available Monday this year, after the octave of Easter, which is Low Monday, April 8th. A Low Monday raised to the heavens. So, As an exceptional circumstance, we're able to concentrate this year on the Feast of St. Dismas, which seems especially appropriate. There are no accidents in the universe, and most especially in the wisdom of the Church. The Feast of St. Dismas has long been recorded in the Roman Martyrology on the 25th of March, together with the Feast of the Annunciation, because of the ancient tradition, along with a penitent thief, of course, died on the anniversary of Christ's incarnation at the time of the Annunciation by the angel Gabriel, which makes abundant the good sense of this feast day and the perfection of its being the alternative commemoration when the 25th falls during Holy Week. So St. Dismas, though, what do we actually know about him? St. Augustine and St. Cyprian both regarded St. Dismas not merely as a saint, but a great saint, one whom we know for a fact from the mouth of Christ himself is in paradise. But the four evangelists tell us almost nothing about him. In fact, it's only in the Gospel of St. Luke that we hear anything at all about the conversion of the good thief. It's only from St. Luke that we know about the promise of our Lord to St. Dismas. Here's the text from St. Luke chapter 23, verses 39 through 43. And one of those robbers who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Neither dost thou fear God, seeing thou art condemned under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done no evil. And he said to Jesus, Lord, Remember me when thou shalt come unto thy kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Amen, I say to thee, This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. The exchange between the good thief and our Lord is absent from the other three Gospels. Why this is, we don't know. Many scholars have speculated on the different tellings here and in many places in scriptures with no clearer result than what we know by long tradition of the Church, that this man's name is properly prefaced with the title Saint, and has been considered so for almost two millennia. Throughout the ages of the Church, historians and saints have honored this penitent, taking St. Luke's word as, well, gospel. Renowned 16th century Jesuit scholar Father Cornelius Alapide wrote, Learn from this the strength, efficacy, and swiftness of the grace of Christ, by which from the cross itself he made a man holy, most holy. Wonderful was the conversion of St. Mary Magdalene. Wonderful was that of St. Paul. But much more wonderful is this of the thief. For St. Mary had witnessed the words and miracles of Christ, and St. Paul had felt him strike him from heaven. But the thief on the very cross where Christ was suffering the infamous and atrocious death of a criminal was converted to him by heroic acts of faith, love, and devotion. St. Gregory the Great wrote of today's saint, On the cross the nails fastened his hands and feet, and nothing of him remained free from punishment but his heart and tongue. God inspired him to offer the whole to him, of that which he found free in himself, to believe with his heart to righteousness, and to confess with his lips to salvation. 
In the hearts of the faithful there are, as the Apostle testifies, three chief virtues, faith, hope, and charity, all of which the thief, filled with sudden grace, both received and preserved on the cross. St. Augustine writes of St. Dismas, To this faith I know not what can be added. If they trembled who saw Christ raise the dead, he believed who saw him hanging with himself on the cross. Assuredly, Christ found not so great faith in Israel, nay, in the whole world. St. Chrysostom, in his Sermon on the Cross and the Thief, tells us, We find no one before the thief to have merited the promise of paradise, not Abraham, not Isaac, not Jacob, not Moses, not the prophets or apostles, but before all we find the thief. On the might of Jesus, he continues, the thief is now a prophet and preaches from the cross. St. Chrysostom names St. Dismas, quote, a robber and a Caesar of paradise. Thou sawest, he says, how he did not forget his former craft, even on the cross, but by his confession stole the kingdom. End quote. We can't help but see for ourselves and marvel at the magnificence and, well, the unlikelihood of such a conversion and wonder. We know nothing about the lives of the two men crucified on either side of our Lord, save that they had committed crimes deserving of capital punishment. St. Dismas admits to being a criminal, and we know he was most likely a thief. And as I understand it under Jewish law, you could have a hand chopped off for simple robbery, but you usually weren't executed. Under Roman law, however, thievery could be punishable by death, especially aggravated by an association with assault, brigandry by which the roads were made unsafe, or robbery somehow related to mischief done by the zealots, who were the officially recognized terrorists of the Roman world. In some biblical translations, the word thief is interchanged with rebel. Though we certainly don't know if Gestus and St. Dismas were involved with anti-Roman terrorism, it's possible that this could have merited the particularly egregious penalty of crucifixion. Whatever the particular offense, the Romans were keen to make an example of these two thieves. We know by the words of St. Dismas himself, as recorded by St. Luke, that both he and Gestus were guilty of crimes rightfully punishable by death. The salient point, we don't know their specific sins, but we clearly see the contrast of their guilt with Christ's innocence. No doubt this is one of the reasons that St. Luke, whose account of the happenings on Mount Calvary were related by the Blessed Mother, was inspired by the Holy Ghost to include this exchange between Dismas and our Lord. Looking to our Lord's right at St. Dismas, we see that salvation is possible until the very last moment, but on his left we see Gestus and know that it isn't guaranteed. Salvation comes down to an act of the individual will and considerable grace. God made us without us, but he won't save us without us. To end up compiling all that we don't know about today's saint, we have no sure record that the names of the two thieves were actually Gestus and Dismas. Their names aren't mentioned in scriptures, but the tradition of the names goes all the way back to the writings of Nicodemus in the 4th century, and it serves well to have names to go by, to give life and breath to these otherwise somewhat two-dimensional characters of the Passion. As little as we know about them, they were real people, with histories that motivated them. Don't you wonder, I know I have, about the life of St. Dismas especially. What led to his great moment of grace, the salvation of his soul at the very edge of eternity, and his last second stealing of the kingdom, as St. Chrysostom put it? Was someone praying for him? Did something in his life experience help him see the divinity of the crucified Savior in the wreck of a man hanging on the cross next to him? Or was it just random luck? We can't know for sure until we get to the heavenly kingdom ourselves, but I don't believe in random luck. Something in the life of the good thief prepared his soul to make this great leap toward heaven. One of our favorite authors, Enid Dennis, 
wrote a lovely piece of poetic prose called The Legend of St. Dismas, basing her retelling on a story that has at least a thread of provenance in history, reportedly having been based on a vision of Anne Catherine Emmerich, as well as having been suggested by both St. Augustine of Hippo and St. Peter Damien. This is by no means meant to be a positive history, however, but a fictional account of a possibility, a legend, written by one of the best Catholic authors of the modern era. By Enid Maud Dennis, published in a collection of poems by the same name in 1927, currently available online, and we'll share a link in the show notes. A Legend of St. Dismas The tranquil night had sunk over Nazareth when Mary and St. Joseph left their home and fled across the lonely wilderness, seeking a refuge for the God-made man. No time for preparations had been given, nor needed. Poverty has none to make. Arise, the angel said, and Joseph rose, and calling Mary told her God's command that they should up and fly. No word she spoke, but took her sleeping treasure in her arms, and went with him out in the starlight cold to face the desert with its nameless fears. Thrice on their path had come the day and night since they had left their peaceful cottage home. The cold of midnight and the burning heat of noonday sun in silence meek they bore. Cheered ever by the presence of the babe whose heavenly smile shed light on their way. One night they sheltered in a robber's cave, and found, within the outlaw's rugged home, a kindly welcome from the outlaw's wife. Perchance poor soul much sorrow made her kind, and she was moved to pity at the sight of that young tender mother and her child. Their beauty might have touched a harder heart than that which beat in this poor lawless breast. Perchance some angel's whisper bade her see in these strangers, humble though they seemed, the stamp of more than earthly royalty. She bade them welcome with rude courtesy, and set before them all her homely fare, sweet milk and honey of the desert bee, the which she pressed on them with simple grace. And while she served them, wonderingly she gazed upon the peerless beauty of the child, mingling her ministrations with deep sighs. His childish loveliness had filled her heart with blameless envy, waking all her grief. For she too had one child, a babe whose age neared that of him the virgin mother bore. But ah, not fair like him. A mother's eye alone could bear the sight of his poor face. A mother's heart alone had room for love for such as he while other mothers showed their treasured darlings proud of each small grace or baby beauty, she, alas, must hide the treasure of her heart from sight of all. The very sun of heaven might not shine upon a leper's brow, and such was he, her little Dismas, whom she loved the more that he was so afflicted. Supper done. She brought a bath to wash the stranger child, and Mary, while she gently thanked her, saw more than one tear into the water drop. Touched to the heart, she asked, Why weepest thou? And lo, the mother of the leopard child looked at the mother of the child most fair, most beautiful among the sons of men, and in that face saw naught but tenderness and deep compassion for her untold grief. She spoke no word, but slowly crossed the room to that dark corner, where safe out of sight the little leper, all unconscious, lay, and brought the sleeping child to Mary's side, showing her sadly its disfigurement. And Mary, ah, mayhap there woke in her even then the universal motherhood she was one day to bear for lepers worse than little Dismas, shrink not from his touch, and won his mother's heart by kissing him. Then gently said, Poor mother, weep no more. Thou soon shall have no cause. Go wash thy boy in that sweet water which but now hath bathed the limbs of my fair child. With simple faith the mother took her boy and mutely obeyed, and lo, 
He came forth fair, with flesh renewed, spotless and beautiful, his hot blood cooled, his eyes as clear and limpid as a stream. No happier mother in the world could show a fairer babe, except indeed that one whom she to-night had tended, and who thus rewarded her beyond her wildest hopes. Amid the mystic gloom on Calvary's hill, the two babes, grown to manhood, met once more, the robber and the savior side by side, and both condemned to die the self-same death. Ah, Dismas, thy first leprosy was fair to that which now disfigures thy poor soul. No water from his bath will cleanse thee now. His blood alone hath power to make thee whole. But there's no lack of that. Its tide might cleanse a thousand worlds in one blood-crimson bath. With godlike prodigality it pours in such strong streams that even crimes like thine are borne away in its resistless flood. Look round, poor Dismas, meet those wistful eyes, expressing his heart's wish that thou wouldst ask the pardon he is longing to bestow. And Dismas looked and saw amid the gloom that face so pale and patient, showing white against the darkened sky, while tears and blood streamed down it, marring all its loveliness. He heard the voice that ravishes high heaven reply to scoff and jeer and blasphemy by that sublime and everlasting prayer, Father, forgive, they know not what they do. Forgive! Yea, Dismas, pardon even for them who drove those cruel nails. Why not for thee? And Dismas heard, and saw, and he believed. His poor dead mother's simple trusting faith, which three and thirty years ago had won him health within the cave, now woke in him. Below, in silent joy, mid all her grief, his new-made mother stood, and watched and prayed for this the first of that long line of sons begotten in her woe on Calvary. The first she sent before her into heaven, red with his blood, forgiven and redeemed. He heard the other robber's blasphemy, If thou be Christ, then save thyself and us. And strong in his new faith, and with the spell of those pathetic eyes upon him still changing his heart, he said in strong rebuke, Nay, thou and I have well deserved to die. Not so this man, no evil hath he done. Then turning to the silent sufferer beside him, humbly prayed, When thou shalt come unto thy kingdom, Lord, remember me. No more than this. Ah, Dismas little knew the height and depth and breadth of that great heart to which he thus appealed. Back swiftly came the answer from the dying lips of God, This day, my Dismas, shalt thou dwell with me in paradise. Ah, happy sinner, thus was well repaid the hospitality thy mother showed to his so long ago an everlasting welcome into heaven for that one night's rude welcome in the cave. St. Dismas, patron saint of penitence, pray for us. Blessed be God in his angels and in his saints. And a quick addendum, happy blessed birthday to Kevin today, and our best wishes and prayers for a holy and fruitful Holy Week for all the Catholic Family Podcast contributors and listeners.